Hello. This morning, we're going to be in Revelation 2, not Revelations 2, but Revelation 2. So please open your Bibles to Revelation 2. Last week, we started in on the Revelation, and we left off at this picture of Jesus, this picture that as Pastor Chantal looked up online, many have depicted it as terrifying and glorious. But my hope is today that as we enter into a section of the revelation where this Jesus If you look down at the text you've just opened to, because we've all opened to it, you'll see red letters. And this is the way the churches are to interact with that picture of Jesus. And Jesus changes that picture from terrifying to intimate. But before we read, let's pray. God, we thank you that you are here. God, we need you now. God, we need power. We need Holy Spirit power to take what might just rest on our minds. And would you draw it deeper into our hearts? that you may start something here today, that we wouldn't just know the truth, but we would experience it so that we may keep it. God, and we know that, Jesus, you said in your word that when we keep your word, you and the Father come and make a home with us. My prayer is we would walk out of here desiring nothing more than that. So would you come and do work in this place, minister to us through the truth of your word and the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Ephesians, or not Ephesians, Revelation 2, Jesus starts off talking to Ephesus. And remember, as we read these words, we're going to cover four churches today, but there were seven in total, and that number represents completion. This is the complete church. This is a message to them then and to us now. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you first had. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works, I repeat, the works of the Nicolaitans. 
which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is for us. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In the paradise of God. We know the church in Ephesus. There's a letter in the New Testament called Ephesians, because it's written to this church. We've seen glimpses into Ephesus from Acts. Of all the churches, we know this one the best. And Jesus comes and he commends them. And he says, you know the truth. You know what evil looks like. You know what false teachers look like. You know what the works of evil look like. And you hate it. But here's the danger. He gives a even stronger rebuke. So much so if they don't get this together, he said, I will remove the lampstand. This was the representation of the church. Remember all of who he's talking to here. This is the church. They are saved. They believe. They've submitted their lives to Jesus. This is the church. He says, You have abandoned, not lost, but abandoned the love you had at first. And there's a huge problem with this. Because if you are quick to point out what is right and what is wrong in the church, but that's not backed by love, It's called legalism. And within the church, legalism is one of the greatest assaults against love. It blinds us to the value of other people when we're quick to say what is right and what is wrong in a person. Jesus talks about this. Look at the plank in your own eye. But we're so quick to say what's right and wrong. So how do we reclaim this love? How does Ephesus reclaim this love? Well, first we need to know what love is. What is true love? Because the world will give you a very different definition than the Bible will give you. The clearest definition we see in scripture is Jesus himself, but another very clear definition is in 1 Corinthians 13. Maybe you've heard it. Preceding this definition, we see the danger of ministry without love. The very thing Ephesus is struggling with. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, it says this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And here's the definition of love in verse four. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. 
Maybe you've heard this before and somebody has read it to you or you've read it yourself and envisioned yourself running through a field of daisies. That's not this love. This love is hard. This love takes time to bear all things. When somebody is doing something wrong, you get underneath them. You support them. You bear it with them. To believe all things is to believe that there's hope. Hope's all things. You believe that this person is valuable. That they're made in the image of God. You don't just dismiss them because they're wrong. And you hope. You hope. We don't give up. And you endure. This kind of love is hard. And as I read it to you now, it pierces. Because I don't meet this standard of love. I don't have the ability to without help. So this is looking pretty bleak for Ephesus. How do you enter into this love? Or even more than that, he says at the end, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. How do we conquer legalism and fall in love again? Well, as with all these churches, the answer is in the picture of Jesus. See, the picture that that he sends to the church in Ephesus, the part of, of this beautiful image of who Jesus is, that we see as terrifying is the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars in his right hand are the messengers of the churches. Some would translate that as the pastors, those who step into ministry, those who have the apes giftings, which many of you have. You just don't know it yet. The giftings that edify the church, that bring us up together into maturity, into the fullness of Christ. He's got us in his right hand. And these seven golden lampstands, which represent the churches, he's walking among them. This goes back to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word comes and dwells among us. God with us, Emmanuel. If we want to know how this works, how how this conquering and this love collide together, there's a scripture in Romans 8, 37, where, where love and conquering do collide, and it says this, Romans 8, 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, through him who loved us. How do we fall back in love? Those of us who are quick to say what is right and what is wrong, we realize that we were wrong. And he made us right. He laid down his life to make us right in his sight. And when he did that, when he lived perfectly and died horrifically and humiliated on the cross, what happened in that moment was the veil that separated the general area of the temple with the Holy of Holies, it was ripped from top to bottom. And all could enter into the holy place. 
And Romans continues and says, For I am sure that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do we fall in love again? We receive the love of Jesus. We go back to the cross. We recognize the person and the work that he did, that he was, that he is, and that is to come. Which brings us to our second church. The church in Smyrna, back in Revelation 2. It says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. He goes on to commend this church. No rebuke. Because this church is enduring great tribulation and he says, guess what? It's going to get worse. And many of us don't understand this, but this book does not promise physical, situational peace. In fact, it promises the opposite. Your life will get uncomfortable as your soul experiences peace and joy that is unimaginable. It's not if you experience tribulation, it's when. But he says this to the church in Smyrna, he says, be faithful unto death, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Do you remember the image of Jesus that he says, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav. I will always be, and I always was. In fact, he's questioned about Abraham when he's on earth. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. What? Remember, too, he has this white hair like wool. This is in chapter 1. White hair like wool. And here he talks of a crown of life. In Proverbs, this will make everyone in the room with gray hair feel real good. (laughs) Proverbs 16, it says, Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. And then in Proverbs 20, it says, The glory of young men is their strength, but the splendor of old men is their gray hair. In other translations, it says, The honor. I'm not discrediting some of your crowns of glory. But none of us have lived a righteous life. So Jesus says, in the face of this hurricane-like season, don't worry, because I give you the crown of life, because I earned it. He is the only one who lived a righteous life. He lived perfectly died horrifically and humiliated on the cross, and he rose from the grave being the first in the resurrection. And he says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I love this. He goes on to say, he who has an ear, let him hear. That means listen up, church. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. 
We'll talk about this a little later, but he's talking about the perishable and the imperishable. He's saying this crown ushers you into eternity. And he's the only one who can give it to you. Because he's the one who was and is and is to come. Do you see how this picture of Jesus is morphing from ter- terribly glorious, terrifyingly glorious, to intimate? And then we come to the church and Pergamum. Oh, there are martyrs in this church. It mentions one by the name of Antipas. He was killed for his faith. There are martyrs in this church. It's so, such a faithful church. But there's something going on in this church. There's a teaching of Balaam, who's teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. I don't know what that teaching is, but what it's doing is it's getting the church to eat food sacrificed to idols, idol worship, and for them to practice sexual immorality. This church is so faithful, but the teaching of the world is coming in, and their identity is shifting to children of God, the holy people, to worshipers of idols and the sexually immoral. It's changing their identity. And this goes on today. As we just consume, 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 the world gives us our identity. In verse 16, it says, therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. The sword of my mouth. There it is. He preceded this word by saying, the words of him who has a sharp two-edged sword. This is the scary part of the image, right? This is the terrifying part of the image. If you walked up to someone and a sword came out of their mouth, you would run for the hills. That's weird. But in the image of Jesus, it's so beautiful. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Do you have an ear? Listen, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. I will give some of the hidden manna. The sustenance not for your body, but for your soul. Paul talks about the mysteries of the gospel and how when when we submit our lives to Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes, we are finally able to understand what this book means. That it's not a book about what to do, but it's a book about who. It's about Jesus. And he says, I will give him a white stone with a new name on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. This is weird because we don't know what this means. This white stone, when this was written, was used for two things. If you were a victor in the games, you were given a white stone with your name written on it, and it was access to the banquet. It was access to the party after the victory. Do you guys see how that plays out with what this book is about? 
the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that he came, he attained victory on the cross, defeating sin and death. And now he hands each one of us who would come to him a white stone with a new name written on it. Not the old self anymore, a new one. There was another use for this. This white stone was used by jurors to vote in a trial for acquittal. Again, has everything to do with the person and the work of Jesus. We didn't win the victory. We lost. We cheated. And so we were in that trial. And Jesus walked in and he said, he's guilty, but I'm here to take the punishment. She's guilty, but I'm here to take the punishment. Here, take the white stone. I'll be at the party soon. These are good promises. But for some of us, we're not receiving the stone because we're too caught up with the teachings of this world. We're too focused on attaining health, wealth, prosperity. Power. We seek entertainment. We seek comfort. But what's with this sword that comes out of his mouth? Pastor Chantal brought this up again last week. But as we're burdened by the teachings of this world, maybe it's not Balaam and Balak, but it's a different kind of teaching. As we're burdened and we're sorting out what our identity is, in Hebrews 4, verse 11, it says, let us therefore strive to enter enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. In verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It cuts through the crap. If we're willing to sit down and receive this sword, it'll cut through all the crud that the world tells you. And it'll tell you the truth. And the truth is that you are made in the image of God. That you, in the same book, it says that he is the author and the perfecter of your faith. Did you know he's working to make you perfect? Those of you who would submit to this sword who would drive it in morning after morning, saying, God, would you cut away the stuff that you never wanted there, that is piled on? He discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. This sword is sweet. This sword is intimate. It's not terrifying. It's kind. It's patient. And as we head to the the next church, we have to stay here in Hebrews 4 for just one moment because in verse 13, right after the description of the sword that is the word of God, it says, and no creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account It draws attention from the sword to Christ's eyes. In the same way, we see Jesus address the church in Thyatira. It says, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. 
says, I know your works, your love and your faith and your service and your patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first. That's a really good commendation. They've got what Ephesus didn't. But in verse 20 it says, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. This Jezebel is a member of their church. This is not an outsider. This is someone within their church who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. It gets really bad for Jezebel. And anyone who climbs into bed with her, so to speak, But he says, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. That's a strong charge. To you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who conquers, who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with an iron rod and when earth, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star, that's Jesus himself. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a church who has the love, but they're tolerating sin. They're tolerating one in their church who is causing others to stumble, causing others to sin, so much so that they're eating food sacrificed to idols, and they're engaging in sexual immorality. But once again, how do you love someone and not tolerate their sin? The key is in the picture of Jesus. It's in his eyes of fire and his feet of burnished bronze. We see pictures of fire all throughout scripture. I love the one in Ezekiel 1 where he looks at the throne with this human-like figure on it, and there's fire everywhere and a rainbow, and it just sounds wild. But the fire in Christ's eyes can best be described by John the Baptist. In Luke chapter three, John the Baptist speaks of two fires. The first fire, he describes that the ax is laying at the root of the tree and any tree that does not bear good fruit, it'll be chopped down and thrown into the fire. That is judgment. This is much like in John 15, where Jesus says, abide in me and I will abide in you. But if you bear no fruit because you don't abide in me, I won't abide in you the branch will be cut off and burnt. That's judgment. But John also speaks of another fire. In Luke 3, verse 16, it says, John answered them saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
in his winnowing fork, or his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Now, this image gets confused. A, with the fire of judgment, right? If you worship fire, he will give you to the fire. He gives you over, as it says in Romans 1, to what you worship. If you worship the things that end in death and destruction, he will give you over to that. He's very kind. He'll give you to what you want. And this fire is also confused with tares. But in this picture, we see chaff and threshing. And when you thresh wheat, wheat is like most plants, where you've got a seed or a grain hidden within other parts. And the chaff is the stuff on the outside. It's a part of the wheat. It's not a separate plant. We're not talking sheep and goats here. We're talking a part of the wheat. What they would do is they would throw the wheat on the ground and they would grind it with their feet. They would grind it with their feet and then burn the chaff. Do you see this picture of Jesus with fire in his eyes and his feet? He's separating the perishable from the imperishable. Paul talks about this. He talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, the old will pass away. The things that are sown will not last, but the things that are raised in glory will. He's talking about the perishable and the imperishable. Also in that book, he talks about a house fire. He says, you gotta build your house on the foundation that Jesus laid, and whether you use wood, straw, precious stones, whatever it may be, when the house fire comes, it'll test what, what, what the house has been built out of. That this fire is a process. It's a good process. Because I don't know about you, but there's lots of perishable in me that I don't want to stand. And I want Jesus to grind it out of me and burn it off because I want the imperishable to stand. I want the eternal part of me, the image of God part of me to stay. We see this in Roman, or not Romans, Hebrews 12. talking about the perishable and the imperishable in terms of shaken and unshakable. And we see God as a fire. It says in verse 25 of Hebrews 12, this is the same warning that I think he has given to Jezebel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Don't refuse this threshing process. It's good may seem scary, but it's good. For if they do not escape when they refuse him who warned them on earth, much less will they escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, the things that have been made. The physical, the shakeable, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Chaff from wheat. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. 
I don't know about you, but I wanna be a part of this unshakable kingdom. And the summary of this book of Revelation, it's Daniel 7. And it talks about a king who in the face of four monsters, it's wild, go and read it. We'll probably go through it again as we go through this. That apply to every time in history that Jesus is Lord and he's king and he has reign and he has rule, but this kingdom will be given to his holy people. And as we hear his commendations and his rebukes to the church, how do we become his holy people and stay his holy people? We continue to come to the image of God, not terrifying, but intimate. The image of Jesus that is not terrifying, but intimate. The Jesus who, who holds the seven stars in his right hand and he walks amongst the churches. He is not far away. He is God with us. And, and for those of you who want to get technical and say Jesus ascended into heaven, those of us who lay our lives down and submit our lives to Jesus, it says he sends his spirit inside of us. Can't get any closer than that. And then the Jesus who was and is and is to come, bestowing crowns of glory on those who are faithful. We are faithful to meet with God, to meet with Jesus day by day, and then to receive the sword, the sword that cuts away the crud in our life. And what remains is an identity in him that we would be perfected and brought into the fullness of him. That sounds so good and to enter into the threshing process, his fiery eyes and his burnished bronze feet. And he'll grind away what will not last and he'll burn it. We've got a few more churches to go through next week. But just with these four, I think a lot of our bases are covered. Many of us sitting here and hearing this word, this beautiful word, you know you fall into one of these categories. I'm going to ask some questions, and if you answer yes to any of them, I want you to put your hands out in front of you. Are you one who is quick to say what is right and what is wrong without love backing it? Are you one who needs to fall in love with Jesus again because you've patiently endured but that love has been abandoned somewhere along the way? Are you one who is facing a season that seems unbearable. That you don't have the strength to move through it. Do you need God to restore your faith today? I don't know if you know this, but you can't conjure faith on your own. It's actually given by God. Are you one who's weighed down by the teachings of this world? You're so distracted by entertainment, by social media, by the things you're pursuing, money, power, health. Do you need that sword to come? cut away the distractions, cut away the false identity. Or are you one who has a big heart?
but you tolerate sin. Maybe in your own life. Maybe you are Jezebel. Just being honest. Let's be honest with ourselves if we've answered yes to any of those questions. Would you put your hands out in front of you? I'm here with you. God, would you come? God, we need your help. Holy Spirit, would you come? And would you remind us of your love for us. Would you bring to mind the power of who you are, Jesus, and the work that you did on the cross? The greatest act of love that is intoxicating. Would you bring that to the forefront of our mind? Would you drive us into the quiet places today to worship and celebrate you and fall in love with you again. God, for some of us, we need our faith restored. I'm reminded of how, Jesus, you mocked the idea of having enough faith. That we either have it or we don't. And some of us feel like we don't have enough. Would you just give us faith? Would you give us faith to endure? Would you speak to us day by day? Would you clear our ears so we may be led by your spirit through the trying times we may be in? Jesus, I feel burdened by the teachings of this world. It's hard to sort it out. It's hard to remember that I am your child, that I am your holy people. God, would you help us? Would you bring the sword of your word and would you cut away the burdens of this world that this world would tell us we have to pursue or focus on other things, but you give us the hidden sustenance, that you've already given us the ticket to the banquet Spirit, this is hard. So we really need your help with this. Maybe it's easy for us to point out the people who are doing it wrong. Maybe we have love, but we don't know how to handle the Jezebel in our circle. Maybe we are the Jezebel. If we are, would you open up our ears to hear the truth of who you are? Would you give us the boldness to repent, to go undergo the threshing process and have the chaff burned away? But God, for, for some of us, we can identify a Jezebel in our life and we don't know what to do. How do we love them and not tolerate? God, we see the example of you We were unlovable. We were more than a Jezebel. And what did you do? You laid your life down. Would you show us the ways that we can lay our lives down for those who who maybe are doing it wrong? But God, we know that you fight against the sin the debauchery, the things that make you sad to see us walk in. You fought it by laying your life down. Would you show us ways to lay our life down? Would you inspire some in this room who maybe see the wrong in others to invite them over for dinner? to maybe sit down and open up the word of God together and lovingly walk through it together, to start a friendship. 
God, we want to look like you. As Jacob said, we want to smell like you. We need your help. Our hands are out in front of us. We are ready to receive all that you have for us. And would you drive us into the quiet place that we would meet with not the terrifyingly glorious Jesus, but the intimately glorious Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that that's just who you are. It's who you always have been and always will be. In Jesus' name, amen.